Hi, my name is Greta Davis. I'm a fourth year medical student going into plastic surgery. This presentation will cover the indications for and the approach to deep, flat perforator mapping using CT angiography. Breast cancer is common and incidence continues to rise. While local excision with or without adjuvant radiotherapy is an option, mastectomy is the recommended treatment for many women. Following mastectomy, every woman should be offered breast reconstruction. Studies have shown that autologous breast reconstruction offers the highest patient satisfaction. Autologous refers to the use of the patient's own tissue as opposed to implant-based reconstruction. The deep flap is the most appropriate surgical option for autologous breast reconstruction because it involves the use of cutaneous and subcutaneous tissues, sparing the muscle. As compared to the traditional myocutaneous or muscle plus skin technique, this means less morbidity at the donor site, less postoperative pain, and a shorter recovery time. An understanding of the anatomy of the anterior abdominal wall is essential when preparing to perform a deep flap. The arterial supply of the lower abdomen, which comes from both superficial or deep inferior epigastric arteries, can vary significantly in terms of its branching pattern, its course through the rectus muscle, and the location of the perforating branches. By definition, the deep flap is perfused by perforators of the deep inferior epigastric artery, which originates from the external iliac artery just proximal to the inguinal ligament. After running superior medially for a short distance, it approaches the posterior aspect of the rectus abdominis muscle and divides into two branches, medial and lateral, which enter the rectus muscle to feed the muscle in the overlying skin. CTA is the mainstay imaging modality for preoperative planning as the information acquired can help reduce operative time, minimize donor site morbidity, and improve outcomes for patients. The vessels of interest include the deep inferior epigastric artery, the superficial inferior epigastric artery, and the superficial inferior epigastric vein. Venous drainage of the lower abdominal area is via venae comitantes that closely follow their paired arteries to proximal vessels. The small perforating veins drain into the deep inferior epigastric vein and on to the external iliac vein. There is also a constant and large superficial inferior epigastric vein, SIEV, located medial to the SIEA that drains into the greater saphenous vein near the fossa ovale. The deep flap is primarily drained via the DIEV, yet in some cases the SIEV network may be used to augment venous drainage of the flap, especially if flap congestion is anticipated or encountered in the operating room. When the SIEV is substantial in diameter, care should be taken to preserve it during flap dissection as it may be used for venous drainage of the flap. So why do we do perforator mapping? In terms of efficiency, meta-analyses have demonstrated that preoperative deep mapping saves approximately one hour in the operating room. In terms of safety, longer operative times are associated with higher odds of complications, including flap failure, infection, and thromboembolism. And lastly, in terms of cost, prior cost analyses have suggested a savings of $2,862 US dollars with reduced operative time alone. This result may be even higher when factoring in reduced complication rate, even when calculated against the direct cost of the imaging modality. Now let's dive into perforator mapping. So to provide a bit of context, how is the CTA data applied in the OR? Your patient has completed their preoperative imaging and has arrived in the operative suite. The preoperative plan formulated from CTA can be used to mark perforators on the patient's abdomen with location of vessels confirmed by a handheld Doppler. Intraoperatively, knowledge of the intramuscular course of the perforator will aid in dissection, reduce error, and shorten the operative time. After the perforators have been located and dissected down to the DIEA, a perforator angiosome is estimated based on CTA data. Any areas with poor perfusion are trimmed away and discarded. A number of additional steps occur, including recipient site preparation, microsurgical anastomosis, and flap inlay at the breast. Finally, during closure of the donor site, any weak points in the abdominal wall, as noted in CTA or during surgery, can be reinforced. For CTA preparation, the patient wants to be positioned in a similar way to how they will be positioned on the operating table. 
Any clothing and straps should be removed from the abdomen to avoid distortion of the subcutaneous tissues. As far as CT setup, the slice thickness is thin at 0.625 millimeters. The acquisition volume should be around 4 to 5 centimeters above the umbilicus down to the pubic symphysis. For contrast, patients receive an IV bolus of 100 milliliters of omnipec solution, and the scanning direction can be either craniocaudal or caudocranial, but studies have shown that caudocranial results in better imaging outcomes because this simulates the direction of flow within the DIEA. A 2019 publication by Rosen and colleagues provides a helpful video detailing their CTA technique. The link can be found in the image above. The list shown here highlights the data points of interest. For step one, perforator size and location. Any DIEA perforator greater than 0.5 mm should be measured and marked at its point of emergence from the anterior rectus sheath. Preference is given to perforators greater than 1 mm. You should mark the largest perforator in relation to the umbilicus in both transverse and caudocranial directions from the umbilicus. This figure shows a maximum intensity projection reconstruction in the axial, sagittal, and coronal planes. Perforator arteries are marked at the point where they pierce the anterior rectus sheath. 3D volume rendering reconstruction of the abdominal skin is then obtained. The previously placed arrows allow for precise projection of the perforator origin on the skin for measurement relative to the umbilicus. Next, the intramuscular course of the perforator should be noted. This can be described as long or short, straight or tortuous. In the operating room, preference is given to perforators with a short, direct course through the rectus abdominis muscle to reduce abdominal site complications because less intramuscular dissection is required. While this information may not be required or requested in the report, it's helpful to know the perforators can be further categorized into a medial and lateral row. Medial row perforators exit medial to the longitudinal midpoint of the rectus sheath, while lateral row perforators exit lateral to the longitudinal midpoint of the rectus sheath. Medial row perforators tend to have a larger internal diameter, a direct course to scarpus fascia, and greater branching pattern that crosses the midline of the abdomen. Lateral row perforators tend to have a smaller internal diameter, a transverse course to scarpus fascia, less branching, and do not typically cross midline. Next, it is important to identify the DIE pedicle at its origin off the external iliac artery. The artery should be followed distally to determine its branching pattern, which can be classified according to the Moon and Taylor classification. Type 1 and 2 vessels usually have shorter intramuscular courses and are therefore favorable, while type 3 vessels are unfavorable and therefore attention should be given to the contralateral deep in case the branching pattern is more favorable. The DIEA has classically been described as having three distinct branching patterns. These branches distribute five to six major perforators to the muscle and overlying subcutaneous tissues. The Moon and Taylor classification is used to describe this branching pattern. Type 1 has a single trunk, type 2 has a bifurcating vessel, and type 3 has a trifurcating vessel. This branching pattern is specifically described below the level of the umbilicus. One of the more important components of the CTA interpretation is the venous anatomy. The most common cause of vascular complication in deep flat breast reconstruction is venous congestion. In contrast to the arterial supply, Superficial venous drainage is dominant. This has significant influence on the fate of abdominal wall flaps. This means that when the deep inferior epigastric vein is used to drain a deep flap, the non-dominant drainage system is being used, which predisposes the flap to congestion. In all cases, the SIEV should be examined on CTA and intraoperatively, as this can be used to augment venous drainage of a flap that is prone to or demonstrating signs of congestion. So unlike the deep inferior epigastric vein, which travels alongside the DIEA, the superficial inferior epigastric vein can be a short distance away from the SIEA. This vein travels superficial to scarpus fascia and drains into the superficial femoral vein or the saphenous bulb. The caliber of venous perforators, the degree of midline crossover, and the caliber of the communicating vein between the perforating vein and the SIEV are important predictors of venous compromise. 
It can be helpful to identify the presence and caliber of the communication on CTA, as this information can aid in perforator selection. The image on the left demonstrates the location of the communication between the SIEV and the DIEV. The classification of venous connections is helpful in risk stratifying patients and is described as follows. A type 1 venous connection is normal with a straight course between the deep and superficial systems. These patients are good candidates for deep flaps. In type 2, the connections are absent. These patients can still be good candidates if the deep venous system is dominant, as suggested by a large caliber deep inferior epigastric vein. A type 3 connection is atypical or has an indirect torturous course between the superficial and deep systems. These patients are at increased risk of venous congestion and may need supplementary venous anastomosis done in the operating room. CTA can also be used to assess suitability for conversion to a superficial inferior epigastric artery flap or SIEA flap. The SIEA flap is a good alternative to deep flap when the deep vasculature is unreliable, interrupted by prior surgery or trauma, or fails for another reason, including intraoperatively. Benefits of the SIEA flap is that the vessel has no intramuscular course, which makes for easier dissection. However, this vessel has a smaller caliber, making it a more challenging anastomosis and more prone to thrombosis. The superficial inferior epigastric artery arises from the common femoral artery about 1 to 2 centimeters below the inguinal ligament. It then passes superiorly and laterally through the femoral sheath to cross the inguinal ligament, after which it passes between layers of superficial fascia of the abdominal wall, penetrates the fascia, and then branches in the subcutaneous fat anterior to the rectus sheath. The UCSD protocol asks for measurement of the SIEA internal diameter at the inguinal ligament. It is important to note that this vessel is absent in up to one-third of patients and can arise as a common trunk with a superior circumflex iliac artery in about one-third of patients as well. The final step in CTA interpretation is assessing the abdominal wall structure. You want to look for abdominal wall herniation and diastasis recti as both of these issues can be addressed intraoperatively during sheath closure. It is also critical to describe as sheath incisions should be modified to minimize risk of injury to underlying bowel. Some surgeons ask for wall thickness or volume to estimate the flap size. So to wrap up the key points of this presentation, what makes for a good perforator? A desirable perforator has a feeding artery and vein that are patent along their entirety that do not demonstrate stenosis or discontinuity for at least 6 cm and ideally 10 cm, that have a diameter of at least 1 mm for the artery alone and 2 mm for both the artery and vein bundle. Finally, preference is given to arteries that have a short, straight course through the rectus muscle for easy dissection. These final two slides demonstrate the macro or deep protocol for perforator mapping that's used here at UCSD. Some of the information included in my presentation is supplementary to what is actually asked in these protocols, but they're important to know as they may eventually or occasionally be requested by the surgeon. And finally, I wanted to conclude that although CTA is considered the gold standard, MRA is becoming the preferred method for perforator mapping, despite being a little bit less accessible and more time-consuming than the CTA. In the near future, the UCSD protocol may begin to incorporate MRA, and at that point, I would highly encourage discussion with the surgeons as far as their preference on what is described in those imaging and what technique should be used.